Hurry, Tommy. Run. It's just a little further. I can't. I'm out of breath. Can we stop for just a minute? My legs are trembling, and I'm sopping wet and freezing cold. You got to. Doc Wood's house is just over that ridge. The two mountain boys had been running for nearly a mile through the frozen wilderness. Their lungs were burning from breathing in the bitter cold air. Neither of them had even thought to put a coat on in the frantic chaos. Finally, they reached the clearing and spotted the mountain doctor's house. Inside of the remote cabin, the rangy, white-haired old man was finishing up his morning grub when suddenly he heard pounding on the door. Doc, Doc, please open up the door. Please hurry. Tommy and little John, what in the devil are you and's doing out here in this freezing cold? It's our sister. Something terrible's happened, and she's dead. Pa sent us to fetch you. What? Which sister? Mary Magdalene. We woke up this morning and she was dead. Pa is a wreck, but he said you'd know how to prepare for the funeral. Well, all right, the doc said. Let me get my coat. And just like that, the grizzled old man set out with the two boys into the vast wilderness of snow-capped ridges. The journey would take them across several streams and deep gorges since there were no roads in this remote region. Yet, this situation wasn't all that uncommon for the wily herd doctor. Everyone in Greenup County, Kentucky depended on him for everything from setting broken bones to curing fevers with balsam oil and even the practice of dressing the dead since none of the mountain folk could afford to pay a funeral home for embalming. In fact, it was common for folks to keep their recently deceased right in the home up until the time they were buried. Before long, the trio reached the top of a knoll, overlooking a vast forest that still remained untouched by mankind. There stood the small three-room cabin owned by Robert Pitts. He was well known in the area as a former teacher who was currently working at the mills down in the valley. As a single father, he did all he could to raise his six children on his own. The mountain dog braced himself for the scene that awaited him inside the rustic cabin. Once he stepped inside, he was greeted by several neighbors who had gathered at the scene. It's too late, Doc. She's passed on, one of the onlookers said. Where is she? The mountain doctor asked. Another man nodded his head towards the kitchen table, where the three-year-old child's body rested underneath a white sheet. Doc Woods took a deep breath and slowly lifted the sheet. There before him was Mary Magdalene, a beautiful three-year-old girl with golden blonde hair. What happened to this girl? Where's her father? He demanded of the housekeeper who was standing nearby. I, I don't know what happened to her. She was always thirsty and wanted water. We did the best we could to tend to her. And this morning when we woke up, she was dead. Her father went to town to gather some things for the funeral. The doc turned again to little Mary. She was wearing a white stained nightgown. But curiously, she had scars as well as fresh wounds all over her legs and her arms. But worst of all was a vicious head wound with an odd U-shaped formation. The old man had seen a lot of things during his days of witnessing outlaw killings, mountain feuds, and tragic accidents. But this was different. He was repulsed and sickened by what he saw. What were these mysterious wounds? He had many questions, but he remained silent as he prepared the young girl for her funeral. And when he finished, Without saying a word, he picked up his hat and he exited the dark cabin. Back in those days, mountain folks did their best to steer clear of the flatland folks that lived down in the valley with their elected officials, city doctors with their book learning in their sheepskins, and especially law enforcement. Heck, mountain folks settled things themselves just as they had for hundreds of years. So it was unthinkable in the mind of the Greenup County coroner, Lewis Compton, when he looked up and he saw Doc Woods standing in the door of his office. That's right. Within hours of leaving the pit's cabin that morning, the mountain doctor paid a visit to the man he had long despised and had little trust for. But he had a strong suspicion in his heart that young Mary Magdalene's death wasn't from natural causes. The coroner listened intently as the old man described the details of the girl's passing. Well, what do you think happened? Corner Compton asked. The mountain doc paused for a moment. Well, as I was preparing the body, I didn't have time to fully examine it, of course, on account of so many folks in the room looking over my shoulder. 
but I did notice a bottle of patient medicine pills in the room. Thus, as far as I can figure, I calculate she might have been poisoned. Mr. Compton had heard enough, and he immediately paid a visit to his friend, the old Civil War veteran and county judge, Robert Parsons. The two felt that there was enough of a suspicion to send two officers and a medical coroner up to the mountain cabin and take a look for themselves. Up the rough mountain road they went. Within a couple miles, the road became impassable and the men were forced to abandon their automobile. Through the thick woods they struggled, crossing a stream and then up another ridge through a laurel thicket before emerging within sight of the cabin. Despite the bitter cold whipping atop the ridge, just beyond the fresh grave that had been dug in the yard where Mary Magdalene would soon be placed, a small crowd of mountain folks stood quietly with their eyes fixed steadily with suspicion on the officer's sudden appearance on the scene. The officers continued through the crowd and they made their way to the cabin door where they entered. Inside was another large group of folks gathered around the young girl's body. Reverend Gallen was making his final preparations for the service, which was about to begin. The clicking of forks and knives could be heard coming from the next room where still more folks were gathered eating a chicken dinner. All eyes stared at the officers, waiting on them to state their business. We're officers from the county seat, and we want to take a look around. The clattering of dishes ceased as the stern faces of mountain men leaned back and watched every move of the city folks. By now, the folks who had been in the yard had made their way inside the cabin, which was packed to the point of suffocation. Where's the father, Robert Pitts? asked the sheriff. Well, he's gone to Ashland. There was a donation of flowers for the funeral. He'll be back most any minute. What about the housekeeper, Marie Frazier? Where is she? The officer continued. One man nodded towards the bedroom. She's in there. Within a moment, the housekeeper appeared before the law officers, answering their questions with short, jerky sentences. When asked what happened to Mary Magdalene, she repeated, She wanted water all the time. She was powerful sick, and we did all we could to take care of her. Meanwhile, the medical doctor was busy examining the little girl, studying the dark sores on her back and her legs. He took his fingers and he parted Mary's hair, revealing the head wound, and he began taking a scrutinizing look. This looks suspicious, all right, but I could take a much better examination if the body was taken back to town. Suddenly, the cabin door opened, and there stood Robert Pitts, Mary Magdalene's father, with an arm full of flowers. But the look on his face changed immediately when he saw the city folks standing over his daughter's body. The sheriff broke the silence. Mr. Pitt, we're taking the girl's body with us for an autopsy. The hell you are. This is her funeral. The father snapped back. What happened to her head? The city doctor asked. The housekeeper spoke up. Well, she was leaning over the fireplace, and she fell and she hit her head over that grate. The sheriff looked over at the fireplace as the woman spoke. Yet something caught his eye, but it wasn't that grate. Instead, it was a U-shaped fire poker leaning against the wall. And what about those bruises? Well, they just appeared after her death, the grieving father replied. Look, I don't know what this is all about, but I love that child, and I had it thrown up to me constantly that I treated her better than any of my other children. Is that a fact? The sheriff replied. Well, like I said, you ain't bearing her today, and we're taking her with us. You'll have your chance to say your say after we examine her. And with that, the traditional mountain funeral ceased to be, and Mary Magdalene was taken to the coroner's office to be fully examined. But what would they find? Once they arrived back to the medical examiner's office, the trio of a city doctor, the county coroner, and the undertaker began the awful task of determining the cause of death. The girl's head, arms, and legs were covered in suspicious dark bruises and cuts, yet none of them were prepared for what they saw once they removed her nightgown. Her entire body was covered with vicious wounds and burns. Even though the undertaker was a 21-year veteran, even he had to turn away. It was the most heartless, sickening thing he had ever seen. One thing was clear. Young Mary Magdalene didn't die of natural causes. 
Interviews with neighbors and other children in the home quickly raised even more concerns. The children stated that they had witnessed a housekeeper viciously whipping young Mary on many occasions. A neighbor, who wished to remain anonymous, admitted that he had seen Mr. Pitts whip the girl much harsher than a child at that tender age should receive. Police began digging into Robert Pitts' past and discovered he had been married before, and that marriage produced five children. But strangely, his wife had died. Before long, he began a relationship with another woman, and though the two were never married, Mary Magdalene was born. Police located her mother, who was living on a houseboat on the Ohio River. She stated that Mr. Pitts had beat her and that she fled for her life. And what about this relationship with Miss Frazier? Was she really a housekeeper or something more? A little more digging revealed that Miss Frazier just happened to be pregnant with the child of one Robert Pitts. Police became convinced that the only two people that knew what really happened to Mary Magdalene were Mary Frazier, the supposedly housekeeper, and Robert Pitts, Mary's father. Warrants were quickly issued for their arrest. Both Miss Frazier and Mr. Pitts admitted to occasionally whipping the child, but they repeatedly denied having anything to do with their death. All the authorities had were suspicions, but no damning evidence. By New Year's Eve, they decided to take another trip up to the cabin to take a closer look, and this time without a crowd of onlookers. Up the mountain, Deputy Sheriff Rowland and two officers went back to the scene of Mary's death. Inside the cabin, they found a half dozen bundles of switches that had been cut from bushes outside. They also found a homemade two-inch razor strap and a bloodstained gown of Mary's. As valuable as these items were, the deputy was looking for one item in particular, the U-shaped iron poker that he had seen the day of Mary's wake. They tore that cabin apart looking for it, but it was nowhere to be found. It had simply disappeared. Finally, darkness fell, and the men gave up the search. And as they exited the cabin and were walking across the yard, they heard something, and the men stopped. Hello? It was a voice from behind them. The men turned around to face the cabin. It was a young girl's voice. The men ran back to the cabin. Where are you? We're not gonna hurt you. Just come out and show yourself. The men pleaded, shining their flashlights frantically. But there was no one there. And in that moment, Deputy Sheriff Rowland stopped dead in his tracks. There in front of him, as he shined his flashlight at the window, just beyond the curtains that were gently blowing in the cool breeze, was the U-shaped iron poker holding the window open. Wagon tongues began spreading the word up and down the hollers, and soon a hornet's nest of rumors turned into rage among the hill folks. In an odd turn of events, every mountain man now stood in allegiance with the local authorities, and they wanted to see Mary Fraser and Robert Pitts brought to justice. By New Year's Day, Mary's story had traveled all across America and was front page news. This was the most unthinkable crime anybody could imagine. Folks from Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia, Ohio, and Illinois began flocking to Kentucky by the thousands to see young Mary's body, which was still being held at the local funeral home. Her only ragged stuffed animal was tucked underneath her right arm, and a Bible was placed in her left, and above her battered body, someone had placed a sign that read, Won't you see that I get justice? Day and night, thousands of people came to pay their respects. Grown men openly wept. Women and children wailed. Before long, the town was also full of burly mountain men who had come down from the hills. They were tired of waiting on the city folk's legal system. It was time for mountain justice. The police station holding Pitts and Frazier were surrounded by a thousand men wanting to hang them both. Under the cover of darkness, the sheriff dressed Pitts and Frazier in disguises and smuggled them out of the jail and transported them a hundred miles away to a much more secure jail in Clark County. Once Frazier and Pitts saw the mob that had gathered to lynch them, they both became terrified. For the first time, 
they began to talk. Mary's father, Robert, was the first one to crack and reveal the horrendous details of what happened in that cabin. It was the housekeeper, Miss Frazier, who did it. She held Mary over a cook stove until her body was badly blistered. Once Mary began to heal, Miss Frazier ripped away all the newly formed scabs and rubbed salt, turpentine, and pepper into the wounds to reopen them again. She wouldn't allow Mary proper clothing and she'd make her drink from the creek during the freezing cold. One night, I came home from work and she had Mary hanging by her feet from a rafter in the barn. And the night before Mary Magdalene died, my oldest daughter, Nancy, told me that Miss Frazier had given the baby a mixture of sugar and pepper for a cold. And when I came home the next day, my baby girl was dead. You see, she wanted my daughter Mary dead before Miss Frazier's baby was born. She was trying to get me to marry her, and she was afraid Mary's mother would come back and we would get back together. When confronted with these accusations, Frazier, white-faced and trembling with emotion, broke her silence. So help me God, I am innocent, and I can prove it when the time comes. The night before little Mary died, I woke up and I heard the child crying in a room. It was dark, and I hollered to Pitts, and I asked him what the trouble was. You'll shut your mouth, or you'll get some too. Suddenly, he smashed Mary in the head with an iron poker. The next morning, before he started to work, he said he didn't know whether to go or not. He acted like he was in deep study. He would whip Mary every day, sometimes twice a day, and I saw him hang her upside down for hours as she begged. Sometimes he would go to bed while young Mary hung by her wrist. I saw Pitts hit Mary with that iron poker just before she died, and I begged him to stop, but he told me he wasn't afraid of the law, and he would kill me too. You have to believe me. He's an evil man. As the two awaited trial, the judge finally decided to bury Mary Magdalene. People from all across America had already donated to pay for all costs of her funeral, her casket in the tombstone. The scene was one of the most spectacular spectacles ever seen in Greenup, Kentucky. Over 10,000 people had came by riverboats and trains from all over America to the tiny Appalachian village. Every hotel within 100 miles was full as the mourners filed in for two and a half hours in two separate lines to pay their final respects to Mary. Each of Mary's pallbearers were little girls while hundreds of children carried flowers. Young Mary, who had only known a cruel life of suffering, was taken to her final resting place like a modern Cinderella. Law enforcement and preachers begged the crowd to refrain from violence and let justice be served through legal means. And on that cold, rainy Sunday afternoon, Mary was laid to rest under a tombstone that read, Mary Magdalene Pitts, June 2nd, 1924, December 29th, 1927, cruelly murdered. The entire country waited with anticipation of the double trial of Marie Frazier and Robert Pitts. Both of them accused the other one of the hideous crime while pleading not guilty to the charges. Both prisoners were kept in cells close to each other where they were secretly passing notes back to one another. And in one note found by the authorities, Pitts told Frazier, baby, I got two men that are gonna testify on our behalf. And honey, despite all that's been said, Nobody knows about the box. When Frazier finally took the stand, the courtroom was packed to capacity with over 300 people and more than 2,000 standing outside the courtroom and spilling into the streets to hear her testimony. Frazier said that the box referred to in the letter was when Pitts would put the child with no clothes on, locked in a box in a yard, imprisoning her during the freezing winter. I asked him once, why don't you just kill her and get it over with? To which Mary's father replied, I'm killing her to suit my needs, and I'm killing her by inches. The autopsy results indicated that Mary had indeed been poisoned, just like the mountain doctor had predicted. 
and then the prosecution sealed Robert Pitt's fate when they introduced into evidence two notes found in the father's pocket when he was arrested. The first one contained a long list of items needed for Mary's funeral, and the second, more sinister note read, Better to kill her now than to wait until she's grown and have to blow her brains out with a gun. At the conclusion of the trial, the judge looked at Robert Pitts with absolute disgust in his eyes and he said, You haven't shown as much interest in your child as you would have a hound dog. And a dog would have known how to take care of himself. And he would have bitten you and ran away. But Mary, she couldn't. The case was now in the hands of the jury. The jury returned in 12 minutes. We find the defendant, Mary Frazier, guilty of first-degree murder of Mary Magdalene Pitts, and we sentence her to life in prison. The jury deliberated for three more hours and returned. We find the defendant, Robert Pitts, guilty of first-degree murder of Mary Magdalene Pitts, and we sentence him to life in prison. Thank you.